Okay, guys, so we're starting with the penicillins. Penicillins and pen penicillinase resistant antibiotics. So let's jump to actually the next page, 116. You guys know the drugs that fall <coughs> under the penicillins. I'll be checking them on the drug cards later. So under therapeutic actions and indications, everyone there? All right. The penicillins are indicated for treatment of streptococcal infections, including pharyngitis, tonsillitis, scarlet fever, endocarditis, pneumococcal infections, staphylococcal infections. Um, the list goes on, red bite fever, um, and uncomplicated gynecological infections. At high doses, these drugs are also used to treat meningococcal meningitis. Most of these um, diseases and disorders are above the belt or below the belt? Above the belt, all right? And if you can recall, you go back, um, when it comes to the penicillins, they mm -hmm. tend to treat what? The gram positive, gram negative? Gram positive, very good. Next page. All right, looks like a case study. Someone's been given, um, they being given amoxicillin, so you're going to assess them for any allergy. Something else that's important always when it comes to antibiotics, make sure a culture and sensitivity is done before therapy. When it comes to amoxicillin, it has to uh, store the suspension in refrigerator, shake before each use, and use the measuring device that comes with the medication. <clears throat> Again, you're going to teach the importance of keeping that medication in the refrigerator, and it must be shaken before use. You're going to teach the patient to take the full course of antibiotics, even if they're feeling better. Monitor for any signs and symptoms of dehydration and encourage fluid intake. Something you guys have to remember when it comes to children and antibiotics, they tend to get sensitivity um, more than adults do. They get sensitivity earlier, so that child does need to be monitored when they're taking antibiotics. You do have to, you're gonna teach the parents when the child's taking the antibiotics to watch out for dehydration. If that child has vomiting, if they have diarrhea, there's a high chance they can become dehydrated, so you have to teach a parent to make sure they give that child lots of fluids. You're going to uh, teach them about things that occur when they take the uh, medic the antibiotics, such as thrush. Remember those white patches of the mouth, right? right? Or maybe yeast infection. If it occurs, you consult the doctor immediately. Do not stop taking the medication because we know that could possibly happen with the use of medication because the antibiotics, remember, they kill the bad bacteria, but guess what, they're gonna kill the, they may kill some good bacteria as well. And once that bacteria dies, the good bacteria, the one that is protecting your body, that's a perfect environment mm -hmm. for the fungus to grow. Mm -hmm. So don't stop taking the medication, just reach out to your healthcare provider. On the side here, I wrote candiasis, thrush. Report any of the following to your healthcare provider if your child experiences worsening pain, high fever, inability to swallow, lethargy, dry skin, or a severe diaper rash. Those are situations where you're going to teach your parents to reach out to the healthcare provider. Pharmacokinetics. Many penicillins are absorbed through the GI tract. <laughs> They're sensitive to gastric acid levels in the stomach. Look at this, and should be taken on an empty stomach. Why? We want to make sure that medication is absorbed properly. Contraindications and cautions. Any allergy to penicillin or cephalosporin. And as I told you before, you're going to see this, or you have the potential to see this, not only on NCLEX, but if you go back to take your board to be a nurse practitioner, this is on that board as well. It's very important for you to know. Caution any patient with renal or hepatic disease. 
adverse effects, common adverse effects of penicillin, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, glossitis, stomatitis, gastritis, sore mouth, look at this, and furry tongue. Don't ask me why, I don't know, but it can happen. Super infections, remember the super infections, guys, such as the, the thrush, the yeast infections? Super infections, including yeast infections, are also common and are again associated with the loss of bacteria from the normal flora. Remember, the normal flora, that is the good bacteria that's there to protect you. And when that normal flora dies off, it allows for opportunistic infection. Hypersensitivity reactions can include rash, fever, wheezing, and with repeated exposure, anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a medical emergency, guys. Anaphylaxis that can progress to anaphylactic shock and death. Drug-drug interactions for the penicillin. If penicillin and penicillinase resistant antibiotics are taken concurrently at the same time with tetracyclines, a decrease in the effectiveness of the penicillin can result. This combination should be avoided if at all possible. Aminoglycosides, the combination should be avoided as well with the penicillins. We don't want to give penicillins with tetracyclines. We don't want to give it with aminoglycosides. Nursing considerations for patients taking penicillin, penicillins and penicillinase resistant antibiotics. I'm not going to go over all of this, guys. It's the same stuff we've been going over the week before. We're going to assess them for allergy. All that good stuff. I'm going to skip over here to the side. I'm on page 119. You're going to be watching out for super infection. <clears throat> know those signs and symptoms of a super infection. Monitor injection sites regularly. We want to make sure a patient doesn't get an infection from injection site. Report. And you're going to teach the patient to report any difficulty breathing. <coughs> Look, it doesn't just say headache, right? It says severe headache, okay? Severe headache, severe diarrhea, dizziness, weakness, mouth sores, vaginal itching, or sores to a healthcare provider. Take a look at box 9.6 below. Remember the penicillins help uh, destroy bacteria. It's very important to complete the full course of the penicillin to avoid recurrence of infection. You have to teach that to the patient. Otherwise, once they feel better, they're going to stop taking it and try to save the rest for another day. The penicillin should be taken on an empty stomach with a full glass of water one hour before or two, hour, two to three hours after meals. Why? We want it on an empty stomach. Do not use fruit juice soft drinks or milk to take your drug because these foods can interfere with the effectiveness. Just water, a full glass of water on an empty stomach. Common effects of the drugs. How many times have you seen this guy? Stomach upset, diarrhea, changes in taste. You're going to teach the patient small frequent meals. Remember, small frequent meals helps with those GI upsets. Report any to the following, report any of the following to your healthcare provider. Hive, rash, fever, difficulty breathing, severe diarrhea. Teach a patient not to share their medications with anyone else. Do not use this medication to self-treat other infections. Take the full course of antibiotics as ordered, even if you feel better. Sulfonamide. You guys have my drug cards for sulfonamide, right? Okay, good. So contraindications and cautions for the sulfonamides. Notice that most of them end in what? Sulf end. 
they begin with what? Sulfa, right? The sulfonamides are contraindicated with any known allergy to any sulfonamide, to sulfonureas, or to thiazide diuretics. Notice I highlighted the thiazide diuretics part. You need to know that. Do not forget it. Also contraindicated during pregnancy, we're going to use with caution in patients with renal or hepatic disease. Before we go to the next page, take a look at this table, table 9.6. With the sulfadiazine, the usual indications would usually give it for broad spectrum infections. Sulfasalazine, we usually give that for ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, or rheumatic arthritis. <coughs> And last, our septa or bactrum, we usually give for otitis media, bronchitis, urinary tract infection, and pneumonitis. We're going to use the caution with the elderly. Remember, those the geriatric patients, the kidney's not working the way it used to, so they can't excrete that drug the way they should. Liver's not working the way it used to, so they're not breaking down, metabolizing the drug the way they should, so they have a higher risk of toxicity. Adverse effects of sulfonamides. Adverse effects associated with sulfonamides include GI effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Everything's nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, right? Abdominal pain, anorexia, stomatitis, and hepatic injury. So what I encourage you guys to do, those signs and symptoms that belong to every class of medication, well, you know it belongs to every class of medication. Don't use your brain cells on those. Use your brain cells on the ones that stick out, those signs and symptoms that you don't see in any other classes, because most likely that's what I'm going to be asking you about. You think I'm ever going to give you a question about a drug class and a nausea is going to be your answer? Everything causes nausea, right? All right. <clears throat> Dermatological effects include photosensitivity and <gasps> Steven Johnson syndrome. This is a rare but severe skin and mucous membrane reaction. You need to have Steven Johnson syndrome in the back of your mind when you're thinking about the sulfonureas. Google it to see what it looks like. This is a horrible disease to have. If sulfonamides, we're talking about drug-drug interactions, if sulfonamides are taken with anti-diabetic agents, tolbutamide, tolzamide, glyburide, glipizide, or chlorpropamide, the risk of hypoglycemia increases. That's a big deal because what kills a patient faster, hyper or hypoglycemia? Hypo, much faster than hyperglycemia. So that's very important for you guys to know. You see, I put the star next to it. That's most likely going to be a test question. I might even make some quest test questions out of this one. When sulfonamides are taken with cyclosporine, the risk of nephrotoxicity rises. Nursing considerations for patients taking sulfonamides. You're going to examine the skin and mucous membranes for any rash or lesions. Because when we think of sulfonamides in the back of our minds, we're going to be concerned about what? Steven Johnson syndrome, right? Next page, I'm on page 122. Again, you're going to teach a patient to take the full course of antibiotics in order. You can administer the drug on an empty stomach one hour before, two hours after meals with a full glass of water. You're going to teach that patient to discontinue that medication immediately if hypersensitivity reactions occur. Why? We don't want them to die. Stephen Johnson syndrome, that is lethal. It's deadly. We're going to teach them small frequent meals. Avoid driving or operating heavy machinery if they have dizziness, lethargy, ataxia. And teach them to drink lots of fluids and to maintain nutrition. Report difficulty breathing, rash, 
ringing of the ears, fever, sore throat, or blood in the urine. Next, tetracyclines. That was one of your drug cards as well, correct? No. Oh, no, it's not drug card, but I told you you need to know it. I'm going to test you on it. You don't have to do a drug card, but I'm definitely going to test you on it. And you're going to see this again when you get uh, to OD. All right, so tetracyclines, um, actions and indications. Look at this long list. I'm not going to read all of that to you, but it's right here. We would give it for rickets, mycoplasma, pneumonia, influenza, E. coli. Matter of fact, the most important ones that you be tested on most likely, I'll highlight it for you. If I had a highlighter. Volunteers? Highlighter. Yes. Thank you. So the rickets, the mycoplasma pneumonia, influenza, E. coli, let's jump down to contraindications and cautions of the tetracycline. Tetracyclines are contraindicated in patients with known allergy to tetracyclines or to tartrazine. Pregnancy, lactation. Pregnancy and lactation is like use your con caution contraindication to all everything, right? But there's something very specific about the tetracyclines that you absolutely have to know. Look what it says. During pregnancy and lactation, because of the effects on the developing bones and teeth. So we cannot give this to children or pregnant women. It's contraindicated in patients who have fungal, mycobacterial, or viral ocular infection. Tetracycline should be used in caution with children younger than eight years of age because they can potentially damage developing bones and teeth. <clears throat> and in patients with hepatic or renal disease because they're concentrated in the bowel and excreted in the urine. No small children, no pregnancy. Remember that. Adverse effects. Fatal hepatotoxicity related to the drug's irritating effect on the liver has also been reported. It didn't just say hepatotoxicity, right? Lots of drugs can cause hepatotoxicity. Fatal, deadly, lethal hepatotoxicity. Skeletal effects involve damage to the teeth and bones. We've seen that a million times, damage to the teeth and bones. Drug-drug interactions. When penicillin G and tetracyclines are taken concurrently, and we know this, we should never give it together, right? When they're taken together, the effectiveness of penicillin G decreases. I didn't put a star next to this, but this has been seen on the X before as well. Digoxin toxicity rises when tetracyclines are taken concurrently. Digoxin levels should be monitored and the dose adjusted appropriately if they have to take digoxin while the patient's on tetracyclines. Food drug interactions. Because oral tetracyclines are not absorbed effectively, if taken with food or dairy products, they should be administered on an empty stomach one hour before or two hours after meals, remember, with a full <laughs> glass of water. All right, next page. So a patient's been given tetracycline. You're going to assess them for um, any allergies. You're going to assess them for concurrent use of antacid, iron <clears throat> products, digoxin, or penicillins. I put a star next to it. Make sure you know that. Implementation, again, you're going to teach them to take the tetracyclines on an empty stomach. Full glass of water, 
one hour before or two hours after meals. Teaching for that patient taking tetracyclines. All of this stuff is repeating itself. Can I go to the next page? This I'll go over because I don't think we've gone over this before. Report any to the uh, following. Report any of the following to your healthcare provider. When the patient's taking tetracycline, they need to report changes in the color of their urine or stool. Severe cramps, difficulty breathing, rash or itching, or yellowing of the skin or eyes. Implementation for patients taking tetracyclines. Again, teach them to take the entire course as prescribed. It should be taken with a full glass of water, eight ounces of water, one hour before, two hours after meal. Concomitant use of antacids or salts should be avoided because they interfere with drug absorption. We know with the tetracyclines, you're not giving them with anything. You're not giving them with iron. You're not giving them with um, antacids. You're giving it on an empty stomach with a full glass of water. Teach them to discontinue the drug immediately if hypersensitivity reactions occur. Teach them small, frequent meals. This is very important. See, I put a star next to it and I put NCLEX next to it. Teach them to apply sunscreen and wear clothing. I think I talked to you guys about that last week as well. When the patient's on tetracycline, we want to protect your skin from getting skin rashes and sunburn and having full photosensitivity reactions. Teach them to drink lots of fluids, maintain nutrition. Again, use sunscreen and protective clothing. If they have to be out in the sun, wear long sleeves, long pants, sunglasses, straw or large brim hat, protect their skin. No one to report dangerous adverse effects such as difficulty breathing, rash, itching, watery diarrhea, cramps, changes in color of urine and stool. Key points, tetracycline can cause damage to developing teeth and bones, and they should not be used with pregnant women or children. You're gonna monitor the patient for GI effects, bone marrow depression, and remember, whenever you see bone marrow depression, you're going to be thinking anemia. You're going to be thinking bleeding. You're going to be thinking infection because remember, those platelets, those WBCs, those RBCs are made in the bone marrow. And you're also going to be watching out for super infections. All right, antimycobacterials. When you think of antimicrobacterials, I want you to think of the anti-TB and anti-leprosy medications. Tuberculosis and leprosy. So let's start with the anti-TB meds. <clears throat> Tuberculosis can lead to serious damage of the lungs, the GU tract, bones, and meninges. Because mycobacterium tuberculosis is so slow growing, the treatment must be continued, you guys need to know this, six months to two years. Even though this textbook says six months to two years, when NCLEX asks about this, the choices they're usually given, which I don't know what the wrong choices are, but the correct answer choice is nine months. So kind of just write that on the side, okay? The minimum is nine months. Yes, NCLEX minimum is nine months. Using the drugs in combination helps to decrease the emergence of resistant strains and to affect the bacteria at various phases during their long and slow life cycle. Do you notice how the author went out of their way to let you know twice that this is a very slow um, um, growing this disease? 
The first line drug, uh-oh, first line, ding, 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 ding. The first line drugs for tuberculosis are your, I, I can't even pronounce this drug. This is the INH. Isonazid, the star next to it. Next question is going to ask you about it if you have questions about that one. Rifampin. Pyrazonamide, ethambutol, streptomycin, and rifampentin. I butchered those pronunciations, but you see it. You need to know those first line drugs for tuberculosis. All of them or just for ICI? All of them, but I'll show you which ones show up the most. Your INA, this one. Mm -hmm. And rifampin, these two. They ask about the most. But I don't write NCLEX. So know all of them. Okay, therapeutic actions and indications. The anti TB drugs are always used in combination to affect the bacteria at various stages and to help decrease the emergence of resistant strains. Contraindications and cautions. Any known allergy to the agent, severe renal or hepatic failure, pregnancy. If an anti TB regimen is necessary during pregnancy, the combination of the INH, ethambutol, and rifampin is considered the safest. So these are the three drugs. If the patient's pregnant and after we have to take the medication, this is what's going to be considered for them. Do you have to take all three of them? Um, it depends on the infectious disease doctor. They decide on the, the, the cocktail. Adverse effects. See, I put a star next to this and NCLEX. Make sure you know this. Rifampin, rifabutin, and rifapentin cause discoloration of body fluids from urine to sweat and tears. So while the patient's on these meds, you have to teach them if they wear contacts, uh-uh. For the time being, they're on that med, they have to wear glasses because it will stain those contacts. Alert patients that in many instances, orange-tinged urine, sweat, and tears may stain clothing and permanently stain contact lenses. If you don't teach that that in advance and they start sweating and they see they're sweating orange, they will freak out. <clears throat> this could be frightening if the patient is not alerted to the possibility that it will happen. So you need to know that, guys. These three drugs can cause that discoloration. Benaquiline has a black box warning that has an increased risk of death and has been reported when the drug is used, so the drug should be reserved for use when no other drug is effective. So this is not our first, second, or third go-to drug. It can actually kill the patient, okay? We go to this drug when nothing else is working. The same drug also has a black box warning. I'm on page 129. That QTC intervals may be increased when using the drug. So a baseline ECG should be done as well as periodic checks of the QTC interval during treatment because we know it can affect the heart. Drug-drug interactions. When rifampin and INH are used in combination, the possibility of toxic liver reaction increases. Patients should be monitored closely they are very, 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 very hard on the liver. You're gonna be looking at mm -hmm. those AST and the ALT. You're gonna be looking at that liver function uh, study. Patients taking, there goes that drug again. Betacoline, that's the one that has the black box warning, should avoid any other drugs that prolong the QTC interval. And here's the list up here. All of them.
April 30th. You want to know why with these anti-PD drugs, I have so many stars and so many NCLEXs next to them? Think about it. You're testing, or when you graduate, you're going to be testing for the state of Florida. Do you know how many TB cases we have here in the state of Florida? Yeah. Okay. You're going to teach a patient, use barrier contraceptives, and understand that hormonal contraceptives may not be effective if antimicrobacterials are being used. Those antimicrobacterials can make that birth control not work. They need to use barrier contraceptives. Understand that normally some of these drugs impart an orange stain to body fluids. You have to teach that to the patient in advance. If it occurs, the fluids can stain the clothing and tears may stain contact lenses permanently. Teach them to report breathing, any difficulty breathing, hallucinations, numbness and tingling, worsening of their condition fever and chills, or changes in color of urine or stool. Key points. Anti-TB drugs are used in combination to increase the, effect, increase the effectiveness and decrease the emergence of resistant stain. Adverse effects include rash, an orange tint to the body fluids and GI reactions. I skipped something about two pages ago. I want to go back to that. Go to page 127. These four, the first line drugs, make sure you recognize them as first line drugs for TB. I go to the next page. <laughs> All right, antiviral agents. <laughs> Why did we make a card on macro lies as well? Take the back lights off. 133. Definitely want back lights, but peripheral mic. Start something. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> if I don't have it highlighted, though, I'm not going to. Um, Page 141. Everyone there? <laughs> 141. Antiviral agents. <laughs> All right, antiviral agents, key terms, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome AIDS. When this occurs, the patient's immune system is severely depressed. Cytomegalovirus, it's a DNA virus that accounts for many respiratory, ophthalmic, and liver infections. Your helper T cells, human lymphocytes that helps initiate immune re reactions in response to <laughs> tissue invasion. Hepatitis B, it's a series of potentially fatal viral infection of the liver and it's transmitted, this is important, look how it's transmitted by bodily fluids. Hepatitis C, it's a usually mild viral infection of the liver that can progress to chronic inflammation. It's most often seen hepatitis after blood transfusions. Okay. 
herpes. This is a virus that accounts for many diseases, including shingles, cold sores, genital herpes, and encephalitis. Can you give um, an antibiotic for herpes? No, because it's a viral infection, right? Okay. HIV, it's a retrovirus that attacks the helper T cells and it leads to decreased in immune function and AIDS and ARC. Influenza A, RNA virus that invades tissues of the respiratory tract causing signs and symptoms of the common cold or flu. Interferon, tissue hormone that's released in response to viral invasion. It blocks viral replication. They should have had virus at the very top, right? Virus, this is a particle of DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein coat that survives by invading a cell to alter its functioning. All right, viruses. Viruses cause a variety of conditions ranging from warts. Warts are of viral nature to the common cold and flu to diseases such as chicken pox, measles, and AIDS, all of these are of viral nature. Interferons. Interferons are released by the host in response to viral invasion of a cell and act to prevent the replication of that particular virus. Viruses that respond to some antiviral therapy include Influenza A and some respiratory viruses, herpes viruses, cytomegalovirus, HIV, which causes AIDS, hepatitis B. When you think of hepatitis B, I want you to think of body fluids. Hepatitis C. When you think of hepatitis C, I want you to think of blood transfusion and some viruses that cause warts and certain mm -hmm. eye infections. Let's take a look at box 10.2. Drug therapy across the lifespan, antiviral. So let's start with children. Children are very sensitive to effects of most antiviral drugs and more severe reactions can be expected when these drugs are used in children. Same as antibiotics. A cyclovir for virus, a cyclovir is the drug of choice for children with herpes virus or uh, cytomegalovirus infections. Those should be lowered according to body weight. Remember, when we're dealing with peas, we're dealing with kilograms, right? Those should be lowered according to body weight, and children must be monitored very closely for adverse effects on the kidneys, the bone marrow, and liver. All right, let's talk about adults. Patients with HIV infection who are taking antiviral medications need to be taught that these drugs do not cure the disease. Remember, we're dealing with a virus, okay? So it's not gonna cure it. It does not cure the disease and that opportunistic infections can still occur and that precautions to prevent transmission of the disease need to be taken. Jeff with a star next to that, make sure you know it. Women of childbearing age should be advised to use barrier contraceptives if they take these drugs. When I say barrier contraceptives, what am I talking about? Condom, very good. Women with HIV should not breastfeed. If I had a penny for how many times that concept has shown up on NCLEX, I'd be a rich woman by now. Under no circumstances, if she's HIV positive, she cannot breastfeed.
agents for influenza A and respiratory viruses. Preventing the viral infection is the best option. And that's how it is in nursing and medicine period. We always want to prevent, We'd rather prevent the treat, right? Yes, preventing the viral infection is the best option, but if patients do develop a viral infection, some drug therapies are available. Notice it said therapies and not cure. Agents for influenza A and respiratory viruses include, and you see the list, and I'm gonna tell you which ones to make sure you know. Those cell tamivir, that's your Tamiflu, and your Zunamivir, your Relenza. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and highlight the Remitazines because I've seen that just a couple times, but enough for me to highlight it. Next page. Again, women of childbearing age should be advised to use barrier contraceptives if they're taking ribavirin. This drug's been associated with serious fetal effects. Adverse effects. Paravivir has been associated with serious skin reactions, including <gasps> Steven Johnson syndrome and erythema multiforme. Drug drug interactions. Patients taking romanidine may also experience a loss of effectiveness of aspirin and acetaminophen if these drugs are also being used. The use of ribavirin should be avoided if the patient's also receiving a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, that's the NRTI. The combination should be avoided. Live attenuated nasal influenza vaccine should not be used within two weeks before or 48, weeks, 48 hours after paramavir to avoid adverse reactions. Before I go to the next page, let me scroll up. I want to bring this to your attention. Low cell tamivir, that's the Tamiflu. It's very important for you guys to know that um, for usual indications, treatment and prevention of uncomplicated, um, uncomplicated influenza for a patient who is symptomatic for less than two days, 48 hours. So you will get a test question about a patient that comes in and they're complaining of runny nose, headache, fever, chills, cough, swab taken, they've got influenza, they've got the flu. And the physician orders oseltamivir. And when you're looking at all the history, looking at the information, the patient was symptomatic seven days ago. Are you just going to give that medication or are you going to question that order? So you're going to question that order because look what it says. Symptomatic for less than two days. So as soon as they get those symptoms, if it's been less than 48 hours and they come in with those symptoms, yes, this medication will be very effective in decreasing the, 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 the longevity, the course of um, that virus and the symptoms that the patient has. But we got to catch them less than two days. That's very important for you to know. Nursing considerations for patients receiving agents for influenza A and respiratory viruses. You're going to assess for any contraindications or cautions, such as allergy to antivirals, history of liver or renal disease. You're going to do a physical assessment on the patient. You're going to assess for orientation reflexes. Start the drug regimen as soon after exposure to the virus as possible, usually within two days of the start of symptoms. You have to show the test writer that you understand that this given two days, within two days of that patient being symptomatic. You're gonna teach a patient to take the medication, take the full course. 
Oh, I almost skipped one. Administer influenza A vaccine before the flu season begins, if at, if at all possible, to decrease the risk of, of contracting the flu and decrease the risk of complications. Provide safety provisions, especially if they have CNS effects. You're going to teach a patient to change position slowly. Avoid driving and hazardous tasks if they have things like, you know, dizziness, drowsiness. Key points. A virus must enter a human cell to survive. Agents for herpes and cytomegalovirus. Herpes virus accounts for a broad range of conditions, including cold sores, that's usually your herpes simplex one, encephalitis, shingles, and genital infection. Cytomegalovirus, CMV, although slightly different from the herpes virus, can affect the eye, respiratory tract, and liver, and reacts to many of the same drugs. And the, these are the um, drugs, guys, that treat the herpes and CMV. Research has shown that they're very effective in immunocompromised individuals, such as patients with AIDS, those taking immunosuppressants. And when it says those taking immunosuppressants, what is the first thing that needs to come to your mind as a student whenever you see patients taking immunosuppressants? What are you thinking of? No, chemotherapy um, um, suppresses the immune system, but it's not classified as immunosuppressants. But you're, you're absolutely correct. It does depress the immune system. Organ transplant. And for testing purposes, whenever they say um, those taking immunosuppressants, that's what they're leading to. So I kind of want that to be the back of your mind. Whenever you see patients taking immunosuppressants, I want you to think of organ transplant patients. Um, elderly patients and those with multiple infections, these medications have been shown effective for them. Scrolling up. Um, for cyclovir, the usual indications is the herpes. Famcyclovir, herpes, herpes zoster, shingles, genital herpes. Valacyclovir is usually to treat herpes zoster, genital herpes, cold sores, chicken pox. Can I move on? Contraindications and cautions. Drugs indicated for the treatment of herpes and CMV are highly toxic and they should not be used during pregnancy or lactation. Avoid use in patients with known allergies to antiviral agents and in patients with renal or liver disease. Adverse effects. The adverse effects most commonly associated with these antiviral Agents include nausea and vomiting, headache, depression, paresthesias, neuropathy, rash, hair loss. Drug drug interactions. The risk of nephrotoxicity increases when agents indicated for the treatment of herpes and CMV are used in combination with other nephrotoxic drugs. So are you going to give those drugs with something like an aminoglycoside? Absolutely not, unless you're trying to make their liver shut down. Their liver, unless you're trying to make their kidney shut down. Nursing considerations for patients taking um, agents for herpes or uh, CMV. You're going to do a physical assessment on the patient. Assess their orientation and reflexes. Examine the skin color. You're going to look at the color, temperature, or lesions. Evaluate renal function. We're going to be looking at that BUN, the creatinine, the GFR. 
You can teach a patient to take the drug as soon as possible after diagnosis has been made. Ensure good hydration, drink plenty of fluids. And when I say fluids, I mean water. Ensure that the patient takes the complete course. Look at this, I put a star next to it, important to know. Wear protective gloves when applying the drug topically because you don't want it to be absorbed in your skin while you're trying to give it to the patient. Provide safety precautions such as use of side rails, appropriate lighting, orientation assistance. Warn the patient that GI upset, nausea, and vomiting can occur. Monitor renal function tests because remember, these drugs are very hard on the kidneys. You're going to be looking at that BUN, creatinine, GUF, GUF, GFR, urine output, right? Instruct the patient about the drug. Um, the thing is, whenever you teach a patient about the medication they're taking, they're more likely to be compliant. Provide the following teaching. You know this is going to be a select all that applies. Here's what you're going to teach a patient. You're going to teach them to avoid sexual intercourse if genital herpes is being treated because the drugs do not cure the disease. Wear gloves when applying topical agents. Avoid driving in hazardous, ta hazardous tasks if dizziness or drowsiness occurs. Key points. The antiviral drugs are associated with GI upset and nausea, confusion, insomnia, and dizziness. All right, guys, take a 10-minute break. When you guys come back, we will start on the agents for HIV and AIDS. All right, guys. Agents for HIV and AIDS. I'm on page 150. HIV attacks the helper T cells within the immune system. Loss of helper T cell function causes AIDS and AIDS-related complex. Diseases that are characterized by the emergence of a variety of opportunistic infections and cancers that occur when the immune system is depressed and unable to function properly. So what this is saying, guys, with that patient's immune system being so severely depressed, those opportunistic infections such as Carposi sarcoma and cancers and other diseases, which we'll go over, they have the perfect uh, um, opportunity to grow. Grow is not the word I should have used, but you know what I mean. All right. A combination of at least three different antiviral drugs is used to attack the virus at various points in its life cycle to achieve maximum effectiveness with the least amount of toxicity. The types of antiviral agents that are used to treat HIV infection are, you know I'm not even going to try to pronounce all of these drugs. You see them. There they are, these drugs. Okay? All of those drugs are known as the antiretroviral agents. Let's jump to page 153. Non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. They have direct effect on HIV virus activities within the cell. Contraindication precautions. It is suggested that women should not breastfeed if they are infected with HIV. Adverse effects. The adverse effects most commonly experienced with these drugs are GI related. Dry mouth, constipation, diarrhea, mm -hmm. abdominal pain, dyspepsia, dizziness, blurred vision, and headache have also been reported. Drug drug interactions. Life threatening effects can occur if. Somebody pronounce that drug for me. 
The labradine is combined with antiarrhythmics, clarithromycin, dapsone, anti-tuberculosis drugs, calcium channel blockers, warfarin, quinidine, adenavir, sequinavir, or dapsone. These combinations these combinations should be avoided if at all possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to think of you every time. <laughs> Nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. <clears throat> okay, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the NRTIs, were the first class of drugs developed to treat HIV infections. Contraindication precautions. Of the nucleosides, cytovidine is the only agent that has been proven to be safe during pregnancy. Women infected with HIV are urged not to breastfeed. How many times have we seen this in the book? Okay, you know it's going to be a test question. Don't play. Adverse effects. <laughs> Serious to fatal hypersensitivity reactions have occurred with a bacivir, and it must be stopped immediately at any sign of hypersensitivity reaction. What are those hypersensitivity reactions? Fever, chill, rash fatigue, GI upset, and flu-like symptoms. Those flu-like symptoms such as the general malaise, fever, chills, cough, headache, right? Those flu-like symptoms. Drug-drug interactions. Severe toxicity can occur if abacivir is combined with alcohol. Do we ever take any medications with alcohol? No. This combination should be what? Avoided. Avoided. Very good. All right, next, the protease inhibitors. Let's drop to the contraindications and cautions. Patients receiving Darren. Darunavir may also be at risk for developing diabetes mellitus or hyperglycemia and may require dosage adjustments if being treated, treated with anti-diabetic drugs. So we got to be careful with that drug. It can cause the blood sugar to go up. Darunavir is also associated with mild to severe dermatologic reactions, including <gasps> Steven Johnson syndrome. And the drug should be stopped if a severe reaction develops. Because remember, Stephen Johnson syndrome is lethal, fatal, deadly. Absolutely. And I have box 10.5. No, you guys know how to do this easy peasy nursing math. Learned that a long time ago. Adverse effects. As with other antivirals, patients taking these drugs often experience GI effects, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, and changes in liver function. <clears throat> All right, so nursing considerations for patients taking um, agents for HIV and AIDS. Assess them for contraindications, assess them for allergies. You're going to do physical assessment on the patient. You're going to assess their level of orientation and reflexes. You're going to examine their skin. You're going to check their temperature, take their vital signs. Look at this. Evaluate hepatic and renal function. Check results of CBC with differential. Why? Because remember the bone marrow, guys. With differential, we want to monitor bone marrow activity and helper T cell number to determine the severity of the disease and to know if the drugs are actually working. How bad is the disease that the patient has? And this cocktail that the patient's on, is it working? Is it effective? Or does the infectious disease doctor have to change it to something else? Implementation rationale, again, you're going to be looking at the kidney and liver function. You're going to teach a patient to take the entire course prescribed.
You can administer the drug around the clock if ordered. Monitor nutritional status if GI effects are severe and take appropriate action. If that patient is vomiting or they have diarrhea, that will put them at risk for dehydration. Guess what? You have to replace that. Teach them small frequent meals to help decrease those GI upset. Teach them to stop taking that drug if severe rash occurs and to contact the healthcare provider immediately. Provide safety precautions such as the use of side rails, appropriate lighting, orientation, assistance if CNS occur, um, issues occur. Teach the patient the following. You know this is going to be a select all that applies. Have regular medical care. Set up a regular schedule for taking all of your drugs at the correct time. Have periodic blood tests to test your liver and your kidneys. Realize that GI upset, nausea, vomiting may occur, but that efforts must be take, taken to maintain adequate nutrition. Avoid driving and hazardous tasks if dizziness or drowsiness occurs. Report extreme fatigue, severe headache, difficulty breathing, or severe rash to your healthcare provider. Box 10.7. Antidiarrheal drugs for patients on antiretroviral agents, because remember, one of those common side effects are going to be diarrhea. One of the potentially serious adverse effects of antiretroviral drugs is diarrhea, which can lead to dehydration, skin breakdown, and infection. Make sure you know that. <clears throat> Again, for those um, HIV agents, you're going to monitor CBC differential. You're going to provide safety measures, small frequent meals, monitor for opportunistic infections, provide patient teaching regarding the drug, the dosages, when they should take it, adverse effects, et cetera. Key points. How many times have we seen this? The HIV virus affects helper T cells leading to a loss of immune function and the development of opportunistic infections. Patients taking drugs to treat HIV need to take all of the medications continuously as prescribed. All right, let's talk about anti-hepatitis B agents. How's hepatitis B trans, uh, um, usually transmitted? Bodily fluids. That B stands for bodily fluids, right? Very good. Hepatitis B, this is a serious to potentially fatal viral infection of the liver. The hepatitis B virus can be spread by blood or blood products, sexual contact, or contaminated needles or instruments. They can be spread by all of these ways. Bodily fluids are the ways that spread the most, but it can be spread by any of these means. Healthcare workers are at especially high risk for contracting hepatitis B, due to needle sticks. Contraindications and cautions. Known allergy, breastfeeding, liver or kidney, kidney disease, adverse effects of the anti-hepatitis B drugs. The adverse effects most frequently seen with these drugs are Headache, dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, and elevated liver <clears throat> enzymes. Here's what's so funny. You see this that I have highlighted? I kid you not. When I was taking my boards for LPN, this was a subject all that applied, right? Now, as of we're in 2022. So as of, yes, as of 2022, guess what? This is still a select all that applies. I mean, it's, the question's different, but the principle's still the same. They expect you to know that. Um, treatment of hepatitis B. You need to stress the importance of not running out of the medication and of using extreme caution when discontinuing use of Ativir. Never, ever, ever stop that medication abruptly. 
We're not going to stop it abruptly unless we absolutely have to. You're going to teach that patient to take the medication and make sure they, they don't ever run out. When they're close to needing a refill, they need to go ahead and get that refill. Drug-drug interactions. There's an increased risk of renal toxicity if the drug's taken with other nephrotoxic drugs, such as what? Thank you. Guys, it's not lunch time yet. Stay with me. Nursing considerations for patients taking anti-hepatitis B agents. Withdraw the drug and monitor the patient if he or she develops signs of lactic acidosis or hepatotoxicity. Caution the patient to not run out of the drug, but to take it continually. Is it continually or continuously? Let me go back. Oh, okay, continually. That was right. Advise women of childbearing age to use barrier contraceptives. Advise women who are breastfeeding to find another method of breastfeeding the baby while using these, this drug. Advise patients that these drugs do not cure the disease. Remember, we're dealing with a virus here. It doesn't cure the disease. There's still a risk of transferring the disease. Provide the following teaching. You're going to teach them to have regular blood tests. Avoid running out of that drug realize that most likely they're going to have GI upset, nausea, diarrhea. Teach them to report weakness, severe weakness, muscle pain, palpitations, yellowing of the eyes or skin, or trouble breathing. Key points. Hepatitis B is a serious to potentially fatal viral infection of the liver spread by blood or blood products, sexual contact, contaminated needles or instruments. When it says contaminated, what do you think it's contaminated with? Blood. Hepatitis B used to be treated only with interferon and rest. And tesavir, adivir, and telvivadine are antivirals now available for the treatment of hepatitis B. All right, we're moving on to anti-hepatitis C agents. Most liver transplants performed in the United States are due to progressive liver, liver disease caused by hepatitis C virus infection. People can get hepatitis C in a number of ways, including exposure to blood that is infected with the virus, being born to a mother with hepatitis C virus, sharing a needle, having sex with an infected person, sharing personal items such as razor or toothbrush with someone who's infected with the virus, or from unsterilized tattoo or piercing tools. Here's the weird thing, you know, I've never done the research to figure out why I really should one of these days, but you see all of these ways they have hepatitis, both B and C can be um, transmitted, right? I kid you not, addition after addition after addition, you'll see that when you get to your med surge, not by kissing. I always found that so weird because when a patient has hepatitis, you can't even share like um, utensils such as fork. They have to have their own fork. They have to have their own plate. They have to have their own glass. But kissing is okay. Yes, that's very interesting. I got to do my research on that one day. Does anyone know why? Okay, I, 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 one, one of these days I'm gonna find out. But yeah. I, and even matter of fact, even if, if let's say you're married to the person, um, you'll see in your message book when you're sleeping in the bed, right? You can't spoon like facing each other. It should be like you face that wall and they face that wall if you're in the bed together. But kissing is okay. How? Why? Anyway, contraindications <laughs> and cautions. Any known allergy, lactation, pregnancy. Use caution when administering these drugs to patients with severe liver disease.
nursing considerations for patients receiving anti-hepatitis C agents. You're going to assess them for allergies, severe liver impairment, pregnancy. Ensure that the patient's also receiving pegintefron and ribavirin or other hepatitis C drugs to ensure the therapeutic effectiveness. They definitely are going to be on the cocktail. It's not going to be just one medication because remember, they have to try to um, be effective during the whole each stage of the, um, the disease course. You're going to monitor the hepatic function, advise women of childbearing age to use barrier contraceptives, advise women who are breastfeeding to find another method of breastfeeding the baby while they're on this medication, advise patients that these drugs do not cure the disease. Remember, this is a viral disease. There's still a risk of transferring the disease. So the patient should continue to take appropriate steps to prevent transmission of hepatitis C. Provide the following teaching to the patient. You're gonna teach them to have regular blood tests to check their liver, check their kidneys. Always take the drug with pigentiferon and ribavirin. Realize that GI upset most likely is going to occur. Nausea, diarrhea is common and teach them to report severe changes in color of urine or stool, rash or lethargy. Summary. Influenza A and respiratory viruses cause signs and symptoms of the common cold or the flu. Herpes virus and cytomegalovirus are DNA viruses that cause a multitude of problems, including cold sores, encephalitis, infections of the eye and liver, and genital herpes. Helper T cells are essential for maintaining a vigilant, effective immune system. HIV, which specifically attacks helper T cells, can remain dormant in the cells for long periods of time. Three drugs have been approved to treat hepatitis B infection. Adefavir, Antesavir, and Telvivodine. 